talk about purple. Hey, and welcome to another episode of the Influential Nonprofit. As always, I'm your host, I'm Marianne Dirsch. I work with nonprofit leaders to master the art of influence so they can ask for and receive all they want, need, and deserve. And I am here today with Farah Trompeter, who I, I Farah, I, I don't know if you remember this or not, but you probably don't remember this, but I met you in 20, I'm going by my hair and outfit at the time, like 2010 in Kansas City at the Nonprofit Connect Conference. Do you remember that conference? <laughs> I should feel like I should say yes, but well, the, welcome to the I'm influential not sure nonprofit. <laughs> I'm turning 50 in April. So, you know, let me just blame that. <laughs> It was, it was, they used to do this really big conference and it was like, like, I would say 2009, 2010 around in there. And, uh, um, and I saw you speak and on branding and I was just like in awe and, and, um, you know, and so I just don't, I, it, it would just, it cracks me up how far back we can go, you know? And um, so I'm happy to have you here. Welcome. Okay, I'm happy um, to be here. And I'm glad, about... I'm glad I made that impression back then. And <laughs> I'm still in your world. For sure. I I just remember thinking, wow, this person really knows her stuff. If and, only I had and... purple hair back then, then you really would have loved me. I right. Yes. So you <laughs> are co-director and co-worker, co oh, sorry, co-director and worker owner at Big Duck. Um, and you have, you've been there a long time, right? Going on 17 years. Yeah. So this was probably, you know, right when you kind of maybe started there around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Started in 2007. So not that long after. Yep. Um, and so a big duck, you build strong brands, campaigns, and teams for nonprofit organizations, foundations, and government agencies, and you direct the marketing and business development efforts seeking to build relationships with nonprofits who want to use communications to achieve their mission. What else can you use to achieve your mission, but communications? That's it. I mean, that's the big thing. Of course, everyone focuses on, I mean, I, we have to do our programs. We have to raise money. We have to change the world, but you know, people need to know who we are and what we do so yes. they can connect with us. And often I think communications gets treated as the, as a PS or a luxury item. And obviously I believe it's to be a centralized item. Yeah. All of those things that you mentioned take communication to ha happen. Exactly. Uh, you know, our, our, you know, ha and, and I do feel like you're right. Sometimes communication can be a PS or, or a, a, a yes. And, mm -hmm. um, the, and, and really integrating it into the work of the organization, I think it's critical. There are some clients where I'm working with them not so much on strategy, but more on internal silo destruction <laughs> into a team where we realized, hey, we're all part of this pipeline mm -hmm. and communications is at the top. And then, you know, maybe fun, a mission advancement or fundraising is at the, but we're all part of the same flow, right? It's not let, it's not silo, silo. It's, it's like, we're all, we're all in the same process of an enrollment. And I feel like that is the big shift that organizations can make. Uh, now, you're a branding expert. So let's just talk about branding. I mean, I remember many years ago, because when I worked at 5-1 Creative, we had to explain to people what a brand was. <laughs> I do. I feel like people get that now, but why, but how do you define it? Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting. A lot of people, when they hear the word brand, they think immediately of the aspects we would call brand identity. So they think about the logo, they think about the name, maybe they think about the experience of the brand, like the website or the latest thing they posted on Instagram. Um, we really define brand at Big Duck as your organization's identity. And it's that it's what audiences encounter, think, and feel as a result of their experiences with you. So that gets into things like perceptions and impressions and associations. And so if you define brand in a bigger way and you think about it as, again, when we talk about how communication should be part of everything that we do, if we want donors to have a clear understanding of who we are, just as we want our community members to, or our staff and our future staff and our policymakers and the media, all of that, the brand, if it's doing its job well, 
it means that people do, you know, we're expressing that identity clearly and in a compelling way across communications channels. And with branding, before we get into things like, oh, we should change our logo or maybe we need our new name or, or we need to redesign our website, we always want to start with a clarity around brand strategy, which we see as really kind of, again, how you want to be perceived and the big ideas that reflect who you are. So at Big Duck, a lot of our work stems from a book that my colleague, the founder of Big Duck, Sarah Durham, wrote uh, around the time that we met called Brand Raising. And brand raising really elevates brand strategy around the concepts of positioning and personality. Positioning, big idea people have in their minds about you. Personality is kind of your tone and style, the emotions people should associate, how you make people feel. And so if an organization goes through a process and they say, we intentionally want to be seen this way, felt this way, um, thought of this way, experienced this way, then it can look at how it's in fact expressing that in its visuals, in its messaging, and across its channels. So do you find that there's a gap between who people are and then that's the gap, who people are and then what they're what they're telling, what they're sharing their story? Like that's not an alignment. A lot of the time. You know, we find for many organizations, the who they are that they're putting forward on the web or social or in person, depending on the organization, a lot of times we'll just use the website as a the most obvious place. Um, the who you are often is who you were five or 10 years ago when you went through that lovely process to rebuild your website. And it may not be up to date with who you are now. Um, or you're putting forward who you are in your communications channels in that 100% aspirational way. And it is no reflection of also the authentic and who you are today. So you're, you're putting, you might be putting forward an outdated version of yourself or this aspirational version of yourself, which is great and amazing, but you're 10 years away from that. And then you put yourself out there. And then when people actually experience the organization, it feels totally different. So when we think about crafting these things, I often describe it as having kind of one foot in the in the now and one foot in the future. So we can be expressing the aspiration, but it still has to be us. And you know, I, I sometimes say, who are you on your best day? Think about that experience, that moment, maybe for an organization, it's a, a community meeting or a breakfast or a gala, or when somebody, it's a museum and it's when someone comes in and experiences the art um, or sees a live performance, like that moment when people are like, oh, they get it. Or I have a, I have a client, a former client called Fountain House that works with people living with serious mental illness. And we did a lot of fundraising work for them a few years ago. And the best way to get to know that organization is you'd visit and experience their members who were people living with serious mental illness that ex were you know, going through programs, but you couldn't tell a member versus a staff with the way that they were treated and the work that they were doing. And if you went on a tour of the space by a member, you really understood what they were about. And so like, how do you take that and right. what is what is that essence? How can we define that, hone that, and then think about what makes sense, how that can come through in things like our brand identity and our communications channels? I love what you said about having like one foot in each, you know, like one foot in the present, like, and then one foot in the future, because that's really how we live. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. Because like, we're, we're always evolving into something. Yeah. And one of the concepts I work with is, you know, um, like understanding a paradox, like I can be both in the present and creating a future. Like I don't have to pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love what you said about that. And I, and also about taking that physical experience, right. And recreating or, or taking the essence of that experience of like fountain house and, and meeting the folks and, right. and having, and, and, and then it's like, so it's like you were there, but you weren't there. Right. And how do you define that? How do you take that? Whatever that experience is for your, for some organizations, it's like, oh my God, if they could just sit down for 10 minutes with this person, they're going to totally get what we're about. Um, or if they can come on in this program or what, whatever the thing is that feels like yes. your best brand representative or your brand ambassador, it could be a video, it could be an experience, it could be a tour, whatever that is now. Now, can we say from that, okay, what's the takeaway about our organization for people who do experience that? How does it make it feel? How would we describe 
that video, that event? What words would we use? What is it? Is it a, a sense of optimism? Is it about being resilient? Is it about being bold and unapologetic? Is it about being warm and loving and caring? What is that feeling? And mm -hmm. so, and then taking that and looking at our communications and saying, okay, if this is really how we do want to be perceived, how are we, where are we in actually accomplishing that? Um, and, and what, how big is the gap? And for some organizations, it's not a huge gap and really they're doing a great job and it's just, you know, they might just need to bring in new approaches and that gets into communications strategy. For others, it is a huge gap. And so making changes, starting with the brand identity and then getting into the brand experience across communications channels is what they need to focus on. Right. Okay. I love that. Um, what I have seen, and I just love to get your thoughts on this, is my experience. Obviously, I've been around a few years as well. <laughs> okay. Is, you know, people would say, if we had a brochure, we'd feel better. If we had a message, we'd feel better. And what I realized in all oh, these so many years is it's actually the opposite, right? Like we, we ground ourselves in our value and our strength. And then from there, we create the message mm -hmm. and that really communications and external communication is an inside out game. Yes. And so if I'm looking at a place like Fountain House, is, is that something you do is like help people? Is that part of this process then is that kind of galvanizing around like who we are and the value that we bring? Yeah, I mean, it is, um, and I will acknowledge, we have not done brand that work with Fountain House. We've done fundraising. Ah, okay. So I can talk about another one of our clients, uh, um, another organization here in New York recently, we helped rename and rebrand called Access Justice Brooklyn. Uh, and if folks are curious, if you go to bigduck.com slash work, you can see that in other case studies. You know, we as, communi as a communications agency cannot tell an organization who they are. We would never presume to do that. Sure. We can, you know, pick up on work that organization has done recently, such as in a strategic planning process or some kind of future visioning. A lot of groups do that work. They don't always connect it to communications. So our job is to kind of, what what's already been done? How do we connect to that? How do the people closest to you perceive you? Where are they? Where do they see opportunities? Where do you see opportunities? We do a lot of workshopping, um, and we also look at peers. Who is your organization? You know, we 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 try to move away from language like competitors. You know, we're big fans, as I believe you are too, of the community centric fundraising movement, which really look asks organizations to stop pitting their missions against each other, but see themselves as part of a bigger ecosystem, and say like we're all trying to, mm -hmm. you know offer legal support to people who need it here in our community. We're all trying to fight hunger. We're all trying to cure cancer, whatever, whatever the area is, how can we work together? And what's my, what's my part of that in the ecosystem of organizations doing the thing that our organizations are doing, where's my slice? And how do I just clarify that? Not in a sense of competing and saying my organization is better than yours, but just, this is what I do. And this is how I work alongside sure. these other organizations. So we do in, in crafting brand strategy also look like to look at who are the other organizations in your ecosystem? What ideas are they trying to get associated with them? And where do you either overlap or where are you different? Um, we have certainly done, we do facilitate conversations. Uh, we've done focus groups and other things related to what is your mission? What is your vision? How do you see yourself? And sometimes we've started branding processes with in-depth research. It really trying to, it depends on what the organization has done and what questions they have. But we do want to know you know, we believe the brand should be following the organizational vision, not the other way around. All right. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, branding follows vision. It does not. We always say like marketing does not set strategy strategy like that. We, right. we, we, we bring it to life, but we create the connections to it. The other thing is a lot of folks, I think what stresses people out is managing different audiences. So how do you help people yeah. define or what is a way that we can define who our audiences are and connect with them? I think it gets a little overwhelming because they feel like they have to do a personality transplant for every different right. group they work with. Yeah, I mean, it is hard. And I will say, you know, this is one of the areas when people tell like nonprofits should be more like businesses. I also reject that premise. Uh, <laughs> but I will say one of the biggest areas nonprofits are different from businesses, including the bottom line of trying to make the world a better place, not just sell a lot of whatever they're trying to sell. 
um, is around audience. You know, a lot of, you know, take a typical for-profit organization, they have more focused audience based in most cases when they're trying to sell a certain thing to X audience. Nonprofits have lots of audiences, including a very passionate and committed staff and board, potentially volunteer, donor, other participant audience who feels very close to the organization. And that's just an important thing to acknowledge in a branding or communications process. But when it comes to figuring out who should be the audiences we're working on, you know, we often ask questions and, and again, a shout out to my, my colleague, Sarah Durham, the, the founder of Big Duck. Another book she wrote is called The Nonprofit Communications Engine. And in the engine, she's got a really simple diagram uh, that's like a, a bullseye graphic. Mm -hmm. And it says, who must we engage? Who, sh who should we engage? Who could we engage? And I think a lot of times, even just an exercise of mapping your audiences across the must, the should, the could can be helpful, mm -hmm. right? Because yes, you are like, you know, I always say, please remove the general public if you've got that on an audience list somewhere. 99% of organizations, not every single person in the world needs to know who you are. There's a group of people who need to know you exist and need to connect to your work that given, you know, we never have enough staff time or money in our organizations, who can you take your resources and really have an impact with? Who really needs to not only have heard of your organization, but when they hear it, they're like, oh, right, I know who they are. They do X, they are Y. And I think that's what we wanna try to get into. So a lot of our work is often trying different approaches to prioritization and really whether it's putting people in a first, second, or third um, listing or the must, the shoulds, or the coulds. But if we put, if we list everybody and we're spending all our time on the coulds, then, you know, we just don't have the budget to do that. And our work is not as effective. So with branding, we start by, you know, let's talk about who those musts are or, the, or who are the primary audiences. Let's make sure that at the highest level, how we're explaining who we are, the messaging we're using makes sense considering those audiences. And then of course, if you're talking to a, an, a particular person who has a particular need, you are going to then have to do some follow-up related to what that person needs, related to the action they might take, where you're showing up to reach them. So you can't do one size fits all for everything, but we start at that highest level and then right. get into specific categories. And I'll just mention, we did a we have a blog post on our site at uh, bigduck.com slash insights. That's a, a resource guide to really figuring out who your audiences are and how to engage them that has lots of great posts on this topic. Awesome. Ooh, that yeah. sounds good. You know, one of the things is people always say, oh, I, you know, I want the perfect pitch if I had the perfect pitch. <laughs> so, um, and also a lot of us are assuming that we're going to be trapped in an elevator sometime or on yes. an elevator with someone. The, the infamous elevator pitch, the infamous yes. infamous elevator pitch. So how do you help people do that? Or what do you think of that? And what other messaging elements besides that are are we working on? Yeah, I I mean, I think um, there, I, there are lots of chances that you have to explain who your organization is. I think the idea of the elevator pitch is this idea of if you just have someone's attention for... 10 or 30 seconds, how will you explain what you do? Because for many of us, it's easy. If I have, if I can sit with you for three hours, I can tell you every single thing there is. I can show you lots of stuff. Most people have very short attention spans and we don't have that access. So we have to start by being able to explain who we are at the highest level. And then ideally equipping our staff, our board, anyone who's an ambassador with the tool to be able to answer the question, what is X? in a very similar way. And then from there, again, they might get into the details of what they do or who, what that person's interested in. But can we all start by saying, our organization is X, we do Y, right? Right. Can we all fill in that blank? Uh, and for a lot of organizations, they haven't necessarily either looked at or equipped their team with that language in a while. So the answer to that question, I might just answer that based on what I do in my department, Yes. Or, or the type of work that I know we do, but our organization does 20 other things. Or I might be like, oh, here's what we do. And I tell you the 20 things. And as a listener, you're just like, I can't hold on to any of that. You've just, my mind is Whoa, not able to see their, process, right? Their, you know, their interest fading. Exactly. You see the like the, the lights go down in their eyes. Um, so with messaging, our process typically, we start by creating key messages. And from there, we get into boilerplate and elevator pitch. 
the boilerplate is the written about us that often does go on your website or on a brochure or the yeah. you know the end of a pitch deck. And then the the key messages are really kind of an outline or a structure of how we tell your organization story. I, I often will say, imagine somebody wrote a book about your organization and I'm opening that book up. What's the table of contents? What are the chapters I need to understand about you? And for a lot of organizations, it's very like, what is the opportunity that we are trying to address or the problem we're trying to solve? How do we approach or solve that problem? What kind of impact are we making and how can you get involved and work with us? And there's lots of different things within yeah. those sections. And it can just be helpful. There's lots of different ways to organize messaging. That's one area, one approach. <laughs> and within that, what are the supporting points? And then again, equipping our entire team, not just the communications folks, with access to that messaging, including that messaging in the brand guide, not just having your brand guide be about the logo and colors and making sure people do know how to write and speak about the organization. Right. We also sometimes look at the written version of vision and mission and value statements and the opportunity to express the brand in those statements, as well as the specific messages you use to engage donors. I know you're focused a lot on, on donor engagement. How are we making the case for people to support us? And how does that connect to the overall story? Great. Um, one of the things I always think about when, it's like when people ask, what do you do? What they're really asking is, what difference do you make? You know, they, like that's what they want to know. Yeah. And when people ask, oh, oh, we do this and this and this and that. And they're like, uh-huh. No, like what different, like what what good are you put like how is the world different and i and especially staff will a answer that way because they're entrenched mm -hmm. in these oh yeah we you know we do this and this and this and like and then <laughs> you know oh you know we um you know instead of uh they, they they go through the programs and services instead of saying like the here's the overall difference that here's what we're doing in the world like oh I, and how we do it is, right right and so it's kind of a, a flip what you know and if people are interested in then how then you can continue that conversation you know I, I just it's just interesting to me because I just I remember I was doing this workshop and this woman said she had her organization on her shirt and she went up to the bank teller and the bank teller's mm -hmm. like oh what do you guys do she said right. we did she did it she goes I could just see mm -hmm. her regretting asking me that question yeah and 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 so you know but oh we do oh community living we help adults with disabilities live independent lives mm -hmm. but what she answered was oh right. i work with we have this day program and this and that oh oh okay that sounds really cool yeah you know yeah yeah you know and now you're continuing that conversation but like what do you do that's often like what difference that's that's how i see it. what difference do you make and then yeah. we can talk about how you know um mm -hmm we kind of get trenched in the how. Okay. Yeah. I love that. And, um, all right, here's a, here's a big question. I think I, I, I think I've encountered in my career, which is, um, do you apply branding approaches to campaigns? Is there a reason to not mm. work inside the brand is, or to break the yeah. brand at some time? <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of people do break the brand when they're creating a fundraising or an outreach or an advocacy campaign. They, they start campaign from scratch. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And the challenge with that is then, then you've gone out there in the world with this campaign, whether it's an advertising campaign, an outreach campaign, whatever it may be. And then people don't really, they get, they get to know the campaign, but they don't realize the organization that's behind it. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge. So it's a practice that I see happen. It only makes sense, or I will say it, not only, it, there's a good reason to do it if the audience for that campaign is dramatically different than the primary audience for the organization and an association would cause harm or confusion. Gotcha. So, um, you know, an example a few years ago, I'm actually not sure if they're still currently doing this. I'll, I'll, I'll speak more broadly. A criminal justice organization, which um, leaned left, was working very much to change and challenge the justice system, including trying to end the death penalty. They found that there were actually a lot of folks in the conservative world who also were against the death penalty, but they their reason for it was different. And so they created a campaign or a sub-brand, an initiative that was was reaching that audience. So it was using the color red instead of the color blue. It had its own look and feel. And if you looked in the, they didn't hide that it was connected to this organization, but it was more, they led with a different brand. And that made sense because they wanted to reach a different audience and show up in a different space. 
So from a campaign perspective, you know, I often look at Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday is now over 10 years old. When it was created, it was intentionally created by the 92Y, now it's its own spinoff organization, to be about creating an international movement for philanthropy. And it wasn't the 92Y's day of giving. If it had been the 92Y's days of, days of day of giving, it would not have taken off the same way that it did. It would have just seemed like it was for the 92Y and benefiting the 92Y. So it made sense there to create a, a much bigger campaign brand. But for most organizations, when you're doing a fundraising campaign or an outreach campaign, it should look and feel like the brand. It might have a different name. You might, for some reason, need to make a campaign logo, but it still should be very much connected to the organizational brand. Okay. Excellent response. And also question, where, how did Giving Tuesday start? <laughs> so Giving Tuesday, now I want to, you know, go to givingtuesday.org to completely confirm this, but Giving Tuesday was initially an initiative from um, the 92Y and the UN Foundation. And it was started in uh, 2011, I think, if memory serves, um, and initially was housed within the 92Y. And then in 2019, it became its own organization um, and now is its own nonprofit at giving, you know, it's always a gotcha. giving Tuesday.org. All right. I don't think I knew that. I'm like, yeah. Whoa. So it started in 2012 officially. That's where the idea was in 2011, officially started in 2012 from 92Y, 92nd Street Y and the UN Foundation and then um, moved into its own organization. Okay, I wanna ask you another question. This may be kind of how this conversation started. People, I think, I don't know, I'm gonna say, hmm, board members will say, can't you get that for free? Or can't you get an intern to do that? And here's what I think, good communications, good marketing, you know, good brand strategy looks and feels effortless. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It feels like it was easy mm -hmm. and people don't understand that what it takes to get to that level of clear and concise, you know, like convoluted it is always easier to get to than clear and concise. Yeah. So, and I just feel like sometimes the value of marketing is not understood because good marketing looks easy, right? It, it's, and so I don't know, do you like, and also the other thing I want to say is a lot, because when we were talking about campaigns, it made me think of this, the pro bono work and like a company will come in and do something for a nonprofit and it'll look completely different and, you know, and out there, they wanting to put into the community, they want to do good work, you know, the, all the heart intentions are in the right place, right. but they're not really tapping into the brand of the organization. Just mm -hmm. some thoughts about, oh, can't we get that for free <laughs> or can we get that? For, now at, at 501 Creative where I used to work, we just didn't do anything pro bono. That was just our across the board thing. We just, yeah. That's it's just not fair. Yeah. It's not an equitable situation, yeah. you know, maybe yeah. we can work with the budget that you have, but we certainly couldn't do anything for free. Yeah. So just your thoughts on that. I mean, we take a similar stance as a, as a for-profit, we are a worker owned cooperative, but we're a for-profit business. And, um, we, you know, we have full-time staff that we need to compensate. And also we, we can't give this much to free for these organizations and charge these others to your point. That's not fair. That's not equitable. We do certainly try to work within budgets, um, and do what we can. We offer a lot of content for free or for very low cost in our trainings and the eBooks and the blogs and podcasts that we do. So that's our, that's our attempt to do that. We've talked about, and we may revisit in the future, having some kind of pro bono fund or initiative that people could apply to of a certain budget size, but we haven't set that up. I know some other agencies do that. I think generally, like, it's great if you, you know, I know it's hard for organizations to justify why should I pay for X when I can get this for free? The challenge sometimes with getting the pro bono, to your point, you might get a bunch of volunteers or folks who are in a corporate space who've never worked in nonprofit, they don't understand the sensibility, they don't understand the culture, they don't understand what it needs to include or not include. And so the outcome is kind of off. Uh, or because it's free, it happens over a very long time. You keep getting a rotating cast of who's working with you. So pro bono can be challenging because the end result is either not something you can use in the same way, or it just takes forever to get it done. There are, of course, great examples of people who have gotten things pro bono, and it's been terrific. So I love the idea of it. But for us as a business, 
again, we're, you know, we, because we work exclusively with nonprofit organizations, it's just something that we, I think probably take a similar approach to what you did at your last organization. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, also, I think there's some investment in the ownership of it, you know, right. and, and because true. here's the thing, like we're not magic wands, you, you know, yeah. uh, I, and people or, um, the best people to work with, the best organizations, are the ones that are committed to their own outcomes, right? They're committed yeah. to doing it. That we just need you as a partner to do it, and, mm-hmm. and you know. And so having, and I think, just investing in that um, gives them the, I, I want to say, the ownership of the outcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the interesting things is um, when I when I'm working with organizations, like I don't really do a lot of that work anymore. Mostly it's via like when people come through my program and anyway, but uh, when people would say, Oh, we came up with this tagline or we, we came up with this. And I would love that because they felt so part of the process that they, yeah. and they did do it. Right. They did like, I'm just a conduit here. Right. Like you, I yeah. always believe that all the answers are in the room. All everything mm-hmm. we need is right here. Totally. I'm the conduit. Um, and, and so I mean, you have that experience of people just like, oh yeah, we came up. You're like, yes, you did. You did. That's right. <laughs> they have that ownership. They, they feel it. They love it. It's like an outfit they want to put on every day. They yeah. can't wait, Yeah. you know, because it feels so good to have this accurate representation. Mm-hmm. You're right. Yeah. A hundred percent. And to that point, I will say, you know, there, there's pro bono. And then there's also what we would call an inclusive process. So to your point of that, that idea of motivation and pride, um, when are we, you know, we're not, we shouldn't just build our brands or, our, you know, with just the senior staff and board members, we should make sure the entire staff is at least informed. If not, there's some ways to, to get their feedback through surveys or interviews or listening sessions, but also maybe how, and if should we be engaging our community beyond our major donors and right. thinking about brand as a chance to build something and, and really connect to your community so that when you do reintroduce the organization with whatever the updated branding is, it like, to your point, it feels built by them and shaped by them. Yeah. And they, and they're, and they're, they're excited to represent it. They're excited right. to wear it, to put it on the right. tote bag or that's whatever, right. whatever, you know, however that's going to dye go. their hair, the color, whatever <laughs> their brand is, as long as it's purple. Exactly. As as we're <laughs> thinking purple here. All that's the time, right. All the time. Uh, all right. I was, okay. Where can people get the free resources again? And I'm, we'll oh, put yeah. the links in the show notes. Yes, tell please. us everybody now. So bigduck.com slash insights is the section of our website that lists our blogs, our podcasts, our eBooks. We've got recorded webinars available as videos. And then we've got an events section on our website where you can sign up for upcoming webinars, workshops. You can see where we're going to be. We're coming to a town near you. All of that goodness. (laughs) Coming back to Casey. Listen, uh, (laughs) then ticket. All right. And then I was remiss in asking you my opening question because I got all excited about sharing our history. Uh, <laughs> tell me one thing that you're proud of that you don't get to brag about a lot. Ooh, I don't know. This was coming. I mean, I am really proud of the team I work with. I really do respect and learn from my colleagues. I don't get to shout them out enough. We just have an incredibly talented and motivated and smart and committed group of people. And as I was sharing with you, as we were getting ready for this conversation in 2021, the founder of Big Duck sold the company to our staff and we are now an employee owned business. And just um, the, the pleasure and joy I get of working with these folks. I wish I saw them more. We are now all virtual. Uh, but when I do see them, I always enjoy that. So I'm really proud of just who these folks are and the company we've been able to build and shape and evolve together. And of course, I'm proud of all the work that we've done and the clients we've gotten to work with. And I feel honored to be able to do that work. It is. It, th- thank you for sharing. And it, it is an honor, isn't it? it yeah. It, it's a gorgeous thing. Okay. My last question is, so if I'm coming to New York or you're in St. Louis and we wind up at karaoke, because that's my thing. What's your go-to song? Okay, so my go-to song is Man Eater by Hall and Oates. <laughs> not because I mean, particularly as someone who's a lesbian, that may not be their theme song of choice, 
But I will say the reason why is that my last name is Trumpeter. And uh -huh. when I was a kid, when that song was popular and on the radio, and we used to be in a car listening to the radio and not just, you know, an MP3 or CDs or whatever it is. Um, when that song would come on, we would sing over it. She's a Trump eater instead of man eater. <laughs> so I like to get the crowd involved. I like to sing that song. So there's there's my answer to that one. You know, and it's not a hard song to sing. And people know the words. Great it's one. always key. Yeah. And they could sing along with that. It's Listen, so to, you know, get a little yacht rock going, a little hole and oats. There is you know. nothing wrong with a little yacht rock. I am <laughs> telling you, I, I, <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Everyone sang that song to you. Oh what's God. your go-to? Oh, there's, I have a list on my phone, but. Um, okay, what's one of them? Okay, so if 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 I've got like one number and I want to wow them, I do um, the Catherine Zeta-Jones version of, of All That Jazz from wow, the Chicago okay. the musical. All right. And for cabaret. some reason, I, can, uh -huh. I get really belty about that one. But then lately I was doing Dua Lipa, you know, like oh. levitating. And yeah. So sometimes I like new stuff. Um you know, sometimes I like the old school just sort of depends. Um, see, I, I believe, you know, like the karaoke can be dismissed. And also it's like full self-expression, right? It's true. Full bodied creative expression. And it's true. Being getting, you know, stepping into your discomfort, let release. Cause what I work with people on was releasing the outcome, like yeah. letting go of what could happen. Cause if I'm so attached to what could happen, then I'm operating out of fear, right? And so, mm. so like letting, releasing the outcome, letting whatever happens going to happen. That's the same thing, like just releasing the outcome. So it really puts you in that practice of that, you know, like just go up and do yeah. the song. You're yeah. not at Carnegie Hall. And even if you were, it'd be okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not auditioning for the voice. It's fine. That's right. You know, we're not going to buzz you. It's Stan's bar on a Friday. Everybody's <laughs> going to be cool. The place is like everything's broken. I like like because like I, I like dive bars. It's all a little bit broken, you know, just like me. Yeah. <laughs> just like, you know, everything's like, yeah, and it, 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 just 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 sing it and see what happens. And so that's like that's part of the exercise mm. of it all. So mm -hmm. all right, well that we're gonna have to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> Bear for being here. I love everything that you're doing. I have loved it for a long time. Just Likewise, big work. fan of yours too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to your listeners out there. And if they want to get in touch, check out bigduck.com. Yes. You can find me, Farrah from Peter on LinkedIn. You can always email me. It's just Farrah at bigduck.com, F-A-R-R-A. And yeah, thanks for having me. And we'll have all that in the show notes. And yeah, Great. thanks for being here. And, yeah. and uh, that's it for this episode of the Influential Nonprofit. If you haven't yet, you can go to the influentialnonprofit.com. You can grab your up-level your influence starter kit with Lots of cool goodies, um, kind of the tricks and techniques that I teach around getting people to enrolled in a vision. So thanks again, Farah. It was great to have you. Thanks for having me.